السلام عليكم ورحمة الله uh, I am uh, Dr. Ghada Gad, Professor of Pediatrics and Neonatology in Shams University Our topic today is Maternal Disease Associated Neonatal Disorders and it will be divided into three parts Now we will start the first part By the end of this lecture you should be able to define maternal disorders affecting the fetus and neonates, whether due to infections or non-infectious causes. Recognize the modes of transmission in congenital and perinatal infections and describe clinical manifestations of congenital and perinatal infections. Outline the management of congenital and perinatal infections and recognize clinical presentations and treatment of some non-infectious maternal diseases that affect the neonates. Maternal diseases during pregnancy can affect fetus directly or indirectly. So what are we targeting in this lecture? We are targeting both maternal infections and other maternal diseases. Other maternal diseases include autoantibody-mediated diseases having direct consequences on the fetus and neonate because of the antibodies that are usually of the IgG type and can cross the placenta to the fetal circulation in addition to maternal diabetes which has another pathogenesis. We will start by maternal infections and we have three major, major routes of transmission for maternal infections. First of all, the transplacental or blood-borne infection of the fetus, which includes syphilis, toxoplasma, rubella, cytomegalo, parvo, virus B19, varicella zoster, and others, when they are known collectively as TORCH. The other route is the ascending infection with disruption of the barrier provided by the amniotic membranes, as in cases of bacterial infections, which occurs after 12 to 18 hours of ruptured membranes. This topic is not our target in this lecture, and it will be discussed with neonatal sepsis session, as it is a major route for uh, neonatal sepsis. The third uh, route is infection through the passage of an um, infected birth canal, and this, of course, includes a list, including uh, herpes simplex virus, hepatitis B virus, HIV, varicella zoster, and others. Fetal exposure to infection results in either abortion, intrauterine fetal death and stillbirth, or premature labor, or totally free neonate, totally free, may present with neonatal clinical manifestations, or the neonate is clinically free, however, later clinical presentation will occur. Clinical manifestations of infections in neonates are rarely disease-specific. A long list of diverse presentations including IUGR, premature baby, poor weight gain, hepatosplenomegaly, cardiac anomalies as PDA or pulmonary stenosis, neurologic anomalies as microcephaly, hydrocephalus, seizures, mental retardation, calcification, Ocular manifestations as chorioretinitis, microphthalmia, anophthalmia, and cataract. Hematologic manifestations as anemia, thrombocytopenia, leukopenia, or neutropenia. Skin rash, nephritis, hepatitis, and finally, non-immune hydros. Combinations of these findings in a neonate, in a neonate guard the guides the physicians to suspect congenital infection, but cannot specify which cause of organism. However, some causative organisms have common characteristic combinations which raises a specific diagnosis as shown in the next few slides. We will start by congenital toxoplasmosis. Toxoplasmosis infection of the fetus occurs if the mother becomes infected while pregnant, which means infection should occur during pregnancy. The earlier in pregnancy the mother is infected, the lower is the risk of an infection of the fetus, but the more severe is the, the disease. And the later in pregnancy the mother is infected, the higher is the possibility of fetal infection, and the milder is the disease. Often it is subclinical infection. It is caused by Toxoplasma gondii, 
85% of congenitally infected infants appear normal at birth, and few cases have fulminant course with early death. Congenital toxoplasmosis has the characteristic triad, hydrocephalus, as we can see in this photo, intracranial calcifications, another CT showing intracranial calcification, and chorioretinitis. The diagnosis occurs by, we can do the diagnosis by PCR of the body fluids or tissues in neonates, including the CSF, serology, IgM and rising titer of IgG, imaging, for example, transcranial ultrasound or CT and others, and the treatment includes sulfadiazine, pyrimethamine, leucovrin. In fact, the most important prevention is that pregnant females should avoid any contact with cat feces. Next is congenital rubella syndrome. Remember that rubella is a highly teratogenic virus. The risk of transplacental transmission is 80 to 90% if maternal infection occurs in the first trimester and decreases to 20% if infection occurs later till week 16 of pregnancy. Neonates with congenital rubella is highly contagious to others and sheds virus for many months after birth, which makes this appear to be like a chronic condition. Congenital rubella syndrome has a characteristic uh, clinical findings, deafness, cardiac affection, whether PDA or pulmonary artery hypoplasia, and microcephaly, and also cataract. Congenital rubella syndrome also has a characteristic blueberry muffin rash, which is due to purpuric skin lesion, and this is another clinical characteristic, taking its name from the famous delicious blueberry muffin. Actually, this rash is not diagnostic or peculiar for congenital rubella. It also can be seen in other congenital infections as cytomegalovirus. Other photos showing blueberry muffin rash. Actually, diagnosis includes PCR, as in most of the congenital infections, whether from the CSF, urine, or blood, serology, IgG, and rising titer of IG, IgM, sorry, IgM and rising titer of IgG, imaging for morbidities, and being highly teratogenic, prevention of congenital rubella syndrome is of major importance. That's why prior to pregnancy, the immune status should be verified. And of course, immunization is contraindicated during pregnancy. We should verify the uh, immune status prior to pregnancy. And unfortunately, there is no available treatment.